So, uh, once again, my name is Petr Stehlík, and I work at Kiwi.com. And I am specifically a Python developer at the Finance Tribe, where we solve all the money problems in Kiwi. So all the, all the money that goes through us. The, the outline of my talk is quite short. So first we will define and talk about what the task queue is. Then I will tell you a short story. I will show you examples versus reality. Then the final setup of how we do it and lessons learned, and if we have time, we will do some Q&A. So, task queues. First, let's define what a task queue is. I was trying to find a simple sentence, how to define it. I felt miserably. So, uh, a task queue is a parallel execution of discrete tasks without blocking. We are here with Python, so most, uh, what comes to your mind is usually celery, or RQ, or something like this high level. But that's not usually just, it, that's the tip of the iceberg, actually. Because the task queues can be found in the hardware, in CPUs, GPUs, everywhere this low. So we can generalize it quite a lot. A, a task queue, or basically the major, major parts for a task queues are the queue itself, the task that needs to be done, the producer of the task, and the consumer of the task. You can imagine it like you're on the market and you're trying to buy a banana or another fruit. So you have the queue, you have the task to buy a banana, you have the producer and the consumer as the, as the customer and the one that, who is selling the bananas. So we, got the, what, we now know what is a task queue, so what, did it, what is it for? You know? And the most usual use case is to decouple long-running tasks from a synchronous call. Like, uh, your, your, your job takes a couple of seconds, but the clients don't have to wait for it in, on the API uh, response. So you, will, you know the result beforehand. So you will just reply that you uh, accepted the task and you're working on it. And then, asynchronously, you can work on it. And eventually, you can, for example, call a webhook to, to mark it as, a, as done or some, uh, send an error to the external service. For ta uh, task, in, in task use, we can also do something periodically, like uh, we don't have to rely on a low-level cron in Linux, so we can do it in high level with more monitoring, more control, we can do it more granular, granular and so on. Then, uh, actually in Kiwi, we used it to break down software to more isolated pieces, like uh, to break down monolithic applications to microservices, or if uh, microservice is too big, just you know, break it down to, to a task in, in a queue, uh, and queue it and work on it. That's it. Uh, with the uh, decoupling, uh, we can also minimize the wait time, as I mentioned, and the latency and response time altogether. So it all comes together. And when you combine everything, it will increase the throughput of your system. So this is what a task is good for. Now the story. We have this uh, small, let's call it microservice for handling accounting data, mainly invoices, and it's called Fantozzi. If you, if you have watched uh, older Italian movies, you will know that Fantozzi is a series of uh, films about an unfortunate accountant. So that's where the name ca came from. And uh, imagine it like that we have a REST API in the front, and uh, then we have the handler and the task and the queues. The initial design uh, you know, counted on uh, quite a lot of queues. There was a webhook library. Uh, we should have used J JSON web tokens. Everything, these fancy names and fancy technologies that you usually hear about uh, on, on some tutorials. Well, there were two of us developing it. And we spent three weeks. With, uh, with, this, uh, with working on, Fanto on the Fantozzi 2.0. And we were deciding what uh, task queue framework we should use. So, uh, sorry, wrong slide. <laughs> and we were deciding uh, like during the whole development. And during the whole development, quite the dangerous sentences were set. The first one is, new is always better. So, you know, Okay, we got this old piece of software. It, it was uh, like created two years ago, so we need to rewrite it, definitely, because it definitely doesn't work. You, we don't care to understand it, so we will rewrite it, and maybe in two years, we, we can do it again, because new is always better, right? Think outside the box. 
you know, because uh, you don't, you, you just uh, know better, you know. So you can you can imagine yourself like uh, the pro, uh, the super duper programmer that knows everything and will do everything better. I know everything I need. Like why why would I care about reading the documentation or you know uh, some best practices or whatever or you know just how to set up the application itself. And then I said, I can do it better. That's one of the most dangerous ones. Because uh, usually when you're using a framework, it's done by a couple of uh, really experienced guys, and they know what they are doing sometimes. It's not, it's not uh, true always, but some general rule is yes. And you don't have to always do better. You know, Sometimes do a bit worse, and it will turn out a bit better in the end. And with that, uh, with these sentences set, uh, there was this uh, small three-week window of, the, of uh, two developers developing. And then at the end of the three weeks, suddenly realizing it doesn't work. It's like a, it's a really bad application. Like it won't uh, scale, it won't, uh, it won't be maintainable. And actually the setup would be harder than uh, with the usual one that we have in Kiwi. So we basically lost three weeks of development type, time because uh, we then decided, OK, we used Redis, uh, Redis uh, queues, or simply RQ uh, framework, to implement it. And then, then, then we changed it to Celery. Changing to Celery took us around 16 hours compared to three weeks of development time. And so we wasted effectively six weeks of uh, person's time. And that's why I'm actually here to tell you why, why it all happened and what would be the best practices for you. So uh, the first thing why it happened was uh, examples versus reality. Because in both like RQ and Celery, you have these beautiful examples of a simple app, just how to scaffold the app, you know, like five lines and that's it, right? Like, yeah, that's easy. Let's do it, you know, because uh, because Redis uh, uh, Redis uh, or RQ is lightweight, so let's use uh, RQ instead of the giant Celery that handles everything for you, you know. But in reality, we suddenly needed a repeater for the task, in RQ, not included, so you had to write it yourself, and then this kind of uh, ugly mask was created to actually do a repetition without not much config configuration in it. Yeah? Don't try to read it, just, uh, that's just to scare you off, you know. But surprise, surprise, in Celery, it's included. So you just need uh, to put some things in the decorator. Five lines, and you're done. You don't, have to, you don't have to write 50. And you have it all parameterized, it's all explained, it's all documented, and you, you're sure it will work. But also be careful, because when we are implementing Celery, and we saw the five-line example of uh, how easily it is to integrate, and we ended up with over 250 changes in the whole repo, which was, at that time, around 1,000 lines. So almost a quarter of the project was changed because we implemented Celery. So be also mindful about this. And suddenly, we have a working application that's maintainable. It's running on Celery, which we are using throughout the whole Kiwi. So we can get help anytime, anywhere from anyone of our colleagues who are more experienced in some areas, some are less experienced in some areas, so we can you know, brainstorm together. And with this, uh, we came in our final stripe, we came to a final setup of how we actually do it, how we scaffold our application, how we develop them. So uh, first, we are using, of course, Python and Postgre. Uh, on top of it, we have uh, Flask or currently a AO HTTP. Together, uh, then we have a connection uh, that, that uh, takes care of the REST API. Of course, we have Celery. For broker, we are using Redis on AWS, so it's managed. We are using multiple deploy targets in our uh, continuous integration pipeline, and we are using Logs.io and Datadog for monitoring, and we are slowly shifting everything to Datadog. And when something goes bad, and really bad, we are using Sentry and PagerDuty for notifying us. So uh, that's how we do it, uh, and uh, th that's, how, that's how the Fantozzi application was developed as well. 
I will break down all the points here so you can know a bit better. With Python, we are always trying uh, or always trying to shift to Python 3.6. And when we are starting a new project, we are always doing it 3.6 or newer, usually 3.7 now. We are also, as I mentioned in the beginning, we are trying to break everything down from monolithic architecture to microservice architecture and uh, using task queues and asynchronous uh, processing. With Flask and AO uh, HTTP, this, these are the go-to frameworks for us because we have boilerplates for, the, for them and we can scaffold them quite quickly thanks to cookie cutter templates. On the right, uh, you, you can see the example in Flask and how we, scaff how we basically instantiate the whole uh, Fantozzi application with all the monitoring, all the, uh, all the sentry uh, exception catching and everything. Uh, just a quick question, who knows what an API, uh, open API 3 is? Okay, not many, so I will explain a bit. Uh, with Connexion, that's, a that's like an extension to, or a framework, it's actually, uh, for Flask and IOH TTP and a couple of others, and it implements the open API 3 specification. So basically, when you, you specify a YAML schema of your, uh, of your API, and it generates uh, documentation and validation for your API. So you have a beautiful Swagger UI, useful for other developers. And you can actually test it there, you have examples, and uh, it's generally useful. So take a note, Connexion or Open API Free is way to go. And just a side note, Open API Free is the successor of Swagger, Swagger, Swagger specification. It was just renamed, so some Law of thingies. Uh, with connection, we're also using token-based authentication and when it's needed, authorization. So we don't do you know, JSON web tokens because they are too complicated. You just need a secret as a, as a bearer token and you're good to go. Celery, so, uh, we follow the best practices, uh, which I will present shortly. And with Redis on AWS, uh, we are using it because it's uh, managed. It's reliable and it's easy to deploy. So we don't uh, lo lose any, uh, any tasks when uh, something happens, when for example, something goes wrong, really wrong. Multiple deploy targets. We are usually deploying HTTP API, the REST API itself, and together with that we are also deploying workers, periodic workers, and so on and so on. And the beautiful guys from platform team created uh, a really useful, useful thing for us. It's called Crane and it's available uh, on GitHub on our Kiwicom account, and it will help you to easily deploy uh, to Rancher via GitLab CI, and it, ca it can help you with uh, messaging uh, channels or uh, relevant people if, if, when you are releasing. With Logs.io and Datadoc, uh, we are using it to extensively lock everything, like uh, when it doesn't lock, it doesn't happen. And with Datadoc and their newest development, we are slowly moving there with all the logs because we can uh, join the tracing and logs together so we can uh, stitch everything with the APM they provide. So that's a, that's a thing to con consider as well. Sentry is when something goes wrong, so an exception happens, it's locked, the stack trace is locked, and we can reproduce the problem itself. And when something really goes wrong, we are using PagerDuty to wake our developers 3 a.m. for nothing, basically. But hey, you get money for it, you know, <laughs> because you're on call, right? <laughs> so, lessons learned, uh, the, why, why we are all here, mainly you. First thing, uh, use Redis or AMQP broker, never a database for Celery. You may ask why, because you, know, you already have a database in your system, so why not use it? Well, it's very simple. Yeah, yeah but let me just wait for the q &A, yeah? <laughs> uh, so, uh, never a database, uh, because imagine that you have like 20, 50 workers in, in your setup, and each of the workers needs to ask the database, like, hey, are there any new tasks that I can take? And the database usually replies no, you know, because you have 50 workers. And then sometimes it replies yes. So imagine that you have like uh, 50 queries to the database a second, just from the workers. 
And suddenly, your product goes wide, you go to production, and it's used by millions of people. And suddenly, the database starts failing. It starts to time out, it starts to, uh, you know, underperform. Why? Because the brokers, uh, or because it's serving as a broker, because it's, uh, uh, it's overwhelmed, overwhelmed by, the, uh, by the workers, because it's always asking for new stuff. So we have a lot of sessions open, and uh, generally you're going to crash. Redis or AMQP broker are uh, designed for this, and they are independent systems. So if they crash, it happens, but you definitely have backups on Redis, right, or replicas. Here is a small example how, how to set up uh, bro bro brokers for, uh, for AMQP and for Celery. Sorry, so for Redis. For, for Redis, you need to install uh, an extension for Celery, so it's, and then you can easily use it. Just install Redis, and you're good to go. You know? That's easy. Second thing to learn, pass simple objects to the task. When you have, for example, an ORM, uh, a mod database model populated with data, you updated it, and you, you commit it, right? And then you pass it to the, ob to the task, and you can work on it again, so you don't have to do a query. And then you commit it again in the task. I see where it, this might go, because the, simple, uh, because the object is quite complicated, and it can go stale quite quickly. So when you, when you, uh, when you put the object or to asynchronous processing, it can go stale without you knowing it, and then you will cre create a conflict in the database, and so on. It, it's much better to pass just the primary key of the object, and then query it again, and have fresh new data that you can rely on. With, with that, you will, uh, you will avoid these kind of problems, which are really hard to debug because it's basically a race condition. Third thing, think. do not wait for tasks inside tasks. Uh, with this, uh, I will talk a bit more about it and explain it later on, but when you're waiting for task inside task, you are creating an endless loop if you have uh, re repetitions, if you don't have a retry limit and everything, so you'll end up with a stuck task that is endlessly trying to do something and is blocking everything, basically. So you can end up with quite, quite a haywire in your system. This comes together with the set retry limit. It basically tells Celery how many times you can retry the task and then just give up race exception and just mark it as successful and handle it yourself. It's really easy. It's in the decorator itself. Just max retries and you're good to go. Use auto retry for This is a really handy feature because you can specify an exception on which the task will be retried. But again, don't forget the max retries. Otherwise, you can end up with an endless loop of a single task, which is, uh, which is occupying one, one of your workers. So you just define the exception that you want to be re re repeated, and again, you're good to go. We are slowly building the decorator, you see. So it's now multi-line. Use retry back of true and retry jitter. With back off, you are, uh, you are specifying that the retry will be, uh, and, and, the, and the wait time between the retries will increase uh, linearly. Uh, there's, a, there's a beautiful, uh, there's a beautiful uh, formula for that on Wikipedia, but don't bother. It will just prolong the periods of time. For example, when you have a, an API that you rely on and it has a 500 error, you can wait one second first. And then retry it again. It's down. It's still down. Then you wait four seconds. It's still down. Never mind. It, you know, five second downtime. Still fine, right? But then you wait for another 15 seconds or so, and suddenly the server is up. Your task is done, and you're happy to go again. With the retry jitter, uh, this is very useful when you have lots of and lots of sim, uh, the same tasks happening at the same time, because when the retry is happening, the jitter will add a small amount of time. Or, the, uh, or subtract a little of time from the back off, so the repetition of the task doesn't happen at the exactly same time, so you don't basically DDoS uh, the other service, for example. And again, retry quarks always set the limit. Set hard and soft time limits. Uh, a soft time limit is basically uh, telling you that uh, 
you know, you should end. So end uh, gracefully, and the time limit itself is hard, and it will, uh, it will kill without mercy. And then again, exception and error handling will happen. Use bind for a bit of extra oomph in your task, basically meaning uh, that you will get a, a reference to the task itself. So you can lock more, you can retry with, with contextual uh, info, actually. So if you, 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 can, uh, you can, for example, decide if you have a network error, you will try five more times. But if you have a, an integrity or error or anything, you just will give up. Or you will just log it and give up because it's the fault of the data, not the, not the API itself. So you can use, for example, logging. As you can see here, we log to standard out. And uh, we are uh, using Datadog to get actually the, the stats for, for the task, if it was successful or not, in quite easy manner. Separate queues for demanding tasks. Uh, Imagine that you have a task that uh, communicates with a very, very slow API. It takes like 10 seconds to actually get a response from it. And then you have a task that uh, usually uses the super fast API that is like milliseconds to do. And you have a single, uh, and you have a single uh, queue for that. You can imagine that the long running tasks will starve out eventually because they will be always uh, preferred for, for the shorter tasks that will happen often and they will come more often and eventually the long running tasks will, uh, will go stale eventually. So it's always better to separate these kind of tasks to, uh, to their own queues. Like for example here you have a fast and slow queue. This is a, like a generic example really. It's better always to name it a bit more precisely. <laughs> and then with the apply async, you just, uh, you just specify the queue and you're good to go. It will help you tremendously. And of course, when you have uh, multiple queues, always don't forget to deploy multiple uh, workers which handle only that specific queue. Prefer idempotency and atomicity. And because I'm a lazy developer, I, I, I didn't, didn't uh, remember the, whole, the, the full uh, the description or definition of idempotency and atomicity. So I asked a uh, good on Wikipedia to help me here. But idempotency basically means when you call uh, one resource multiple times, it will always produce the same result. And atomicity means that uh, when you call the task, it will appear to the, to, the, to the system as atomic, meaning it will happen instantly and without side effects. To sum it up, uh, use Redis or IMQP, plus simple objects to the task. Don't wait for task inside tasks. Set retry limit, use auto retry, use backoffs, use jitter, use time limits, use bind, and use separate queues, and always prefer idempotency and atomicity. Those are the lessons learned. And there are also things to consider with Celery because it's a really, really powerful framework. So you should always uh, take into, uh, into consideration what can go wrong there as well. Because with Celery, you're sharing the code base between producer and consumer. So you need to be uh, really careful about circular imports, the way of uh, how the imports work, and what will load when the worker is starting and what will, what will load when the server is starting or the producer is starting. You sell it to its full potential. You read the salary docs. They are huge, but it's a nice evening read. You know? <laughs> like when you have nothing to do, come on, let's, let's, let's read our workers today. You, know? you don't have to read it carefully and you know, remember everything, like every param that is there. You know, just remember that something like this is there and you can use it. Because eventually, you can use it. It might come in handy. So uh, be mindful, read the docs. And also, always bear in, in mind that you are using third-party APIs and they don't have to scale as well as your application. So be mindful because the developers of that third-party API might not be happy when you shoot them down. That's most of my talk done. 
thanks for listening, and I would like to uh, invite you to our today's party after EuroPython, uh, where you can win flight vouchers. Uh, and uh, this is an invitation uh, party, so visit our booth, and it's somewhere, somewhere there <laughs> on the left. <laughs> I was trying like, to pinpoint the location. And uh, you can defi definitely talk to us. I will be there after the lunch, so we can do so. We can talk together and uh, uh, find out about more, more about the party, and uh, also more info about the party as at the meetkiwi.com. So small, uh, small thing there. Uh, there's a small uh, error. I'm still a Python engineer. I am not an engineering manager there, so <laughs> it's waiting for me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We have about three more minutes for questions. So, if there are any questions, yes, of course, flower is allowed. <laughs> Yes, definitely, it's a nice thing to have, but you need to know how to use it, actually. So yes, for monitoring, like for, for uh, more granular monitoring, I definitely recommend it. But honestly, I personally, I prefer my own monitoring, like in the Datadog, where I can get alerts and everything. So you're like, using uh, basically like uh, command line for something else? Uh, for, for what, exactly? Uh, if you if you uh, design it well, you don't need it. Okay. But uh, we can talk about it later. So okay, next okay. question, please. Well, there was one more, right? Thanks for the talk. Uh, you said that you are migrating to IOHTTP. So, what's your experience when you are using IOHTTP and Celery, and have you investigated? Um, I think enabled like a system like uh, ARQ or s some other things. Uh, with AOHTTP, we are still like in quite early stage, so we don't have a, like a long-term experience with it. But basically, if you understand the async uh, para paradigm, it's ca kind of okay. Let's say the, we don't have uh, we didn't have uh, big problems with it yet. Okay. So Thank no you. lessons learned yet. No expensive things to <laughs> to learn. Thank you. Uh, I would like to know how you do your health checks on the salary workers on the machines. Uh, you how mean health checks? Like yeah. Do you do health checks? And we, we have uh, quite a few, and mm -hmm. we recently put up. But the health checks are taking a lot of uh, processing. So we were wondering if you are doing it right. I would like to know how you do it. Uh, we don't do hard like very granular health, health checks, we do lo logging, and through the logs we can see what is happening. And uh, with that, uh, uh, we are usually deploying quite often, so if you're, for example, asking about the memory consumption and the memory leaks, we don't, uh, we don't care about them because we are restarting regularly, the workers. And we have the, uh, like, a rancher itself or any container management can be set up to restart regularly to re return to a healthy state. So e there are health checks, but mostly for the whole API or for the whole application to see whether the database is stable or the connection to the database is stable, if everything is communicating properly or anything like that. But uh, we can talk uh, about it later on, definitely. Thank you.